This video is about the concept hexiety. The term is discussed in a couple of places in the work of Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari, including in our standard source of reference for these sessions, A Thousand Plateaus. You find it discussed in the middle of Plateau 10. You also find the term used in Deleuze and Parnay 1987, Dialogues. Incidentally, I read the earlier edition of that book. There is an added bit on the end in Dialogues 2, but it's not particularly relevant for our purposes today. If anything, the account in Dialogues is actually a bit clearer, but unfortunately my edition at least does not contain a full index, and this makes it unsuitable for our preferred study strategy which is to look up all the mentions of a concept in the index and then to read around those entries first. However, I noted down a few occurrences of the terms as I read dialogues, and I've supplied a few page numbers where you'll find these mentions in the references at the end. Actually, the examples of hexiotes are pretty similar in both books and so we can rely again on a thousand plateaus. I read some pieces from dialogues and also raise some general issues at the end. The term hexiety has had some appeal for a number of professions and activities, it seems. I found a site called Architectural Hexiates, for example. It's also gained prominence in educational circles, where it is mentioned in connection with a highly successful joint writing project by Gale and Wyatt. They describe their relationship as a hexiety. This view is supported by Deleuze himself, describing his relationship with Guattari as like a hexiety. This actually appears in Negotiations, Deleuze 1995. What he actually says is this, with Guattari we merged to become a non-personal individuality. These exist in nature as well and we call them hexiates. That's page 141. Language passes between the elements. Guattari and I don't feel we're persons exactly. Our individuality is rather that of events. Well, Actually, I find this a bit puzzling, because the hexiety, and the event for that matter, have quite a distinctive philosophical significance, as we'll see. Certainly, Doss's account of their relationship mentions a lot of other normal things, like a wide circle of Parisian intellectuals who all knew each other, mutual fame, and in particular a couple of mutual acquaintances who introduced them to each other but Deleuze himself doesn't seem to want to mention these social factors. So for me, the whole example might actually show a bit of a problem with Deleuze and Guattari generally, that they see the forces of the universe producing events or hexiates directly, as it were, with no real consideration of social factors like the formation of a group of Parisian intellectuals with shared beliefs and so on. If there are social factors, they just act to transmit universal forces with no independent effects. And sociologists, and I include myself in this number, would certainly not agree with that. For our purposes, the hexiety is a good term to think about because it's closely linked to other important terms in Deleuze and Guattari. The event is one of these terms, suggested in the quote from Deleuze above. Another is the singularity, and the hexiety is also an assemblage of a particular kind, and a rhizome. It would take far too long to spell out and disentangle these much-discussed terms, but the point is, if you ever have to or want to investigate these other terms, this discussion of the hexiety might help you get started with those terms as well. As before, we're aiming at gaining a good working understanding that will help us develop further work. At first, we might just have to accept that there are implications that we won't pursue right away, 
we can practice a bit of selection to get at the most important bits. I hope this won't cause you any problems like making you feel guilty or whatever. I think it's especially important with the discussion in a thousand plateaus that you try and avoid being bogged down. It's a good technique to practice with Deleuzean stuff generally. Try not to chase down all the hairs that are set off running in the discussions, at least until you have more leisure and there's nothing immediately at stake. Let's point out a few things in A Thousand Plateaus that are implied in the discussion of the Hexiety, but which can be postponed for later research or just lightly read over for information. First, there's a reference to Spinoza, for example, probably an implicit reference to Deleuze's book on Spinoza. Now, Spinoza crops up in the other topics too, like The Body Without Organs, Luckily, one of Deleuze's own books on Spinoza is fairly readable, but make sure you get the right one because the other one is unreadable. The good one is Deleuze 1988 Spinoza Practical Philosophy, references at the end as always. It is from Spinoza that Deleuze gets the odd 17th century terms latitude and longitude, to describe the dimensions of the hexiety on the plane of consistency. In other words, the philosophical notion of the hexiety, which we're come to. At this virtual level, to quote earlier terms, we find only intensive forces and we could describe them only in non-metricated terms. We have to use terms like speed and slowness rather than precise measures of velocity, so many miles per hour, or we rather than precise measures of velocity, so many miles per hour, or we have to refer to the different time scales in which things appear and come together, and this won't necessarily be clock or calendar time. This dimension of speed and slowness is called longitude. Secondly, Hexiates have the power to affect bodies, in other words, generate affects, including our own. And again, we can note these affects, but we can't really measure them too precisely. We know that some hexiates will have far greater effects on us, be far more important to us than others are, both actually and potentially. Affects stretch in the dimension called latitude, We'll discuss how these terms operate in the examples in a minute. For now, I just want to help avoid a misunderstanding, one that certainly stopped me for a while, because when I read about longitude and latitude, I thought they were being used in the modern sense and acting as a kind of metaphor or a bit of poetry. Well, I don't think they are used in this sense at all. They're technical terms, and these technical terms don't fit very well with common sense understandings. Well, we can skip this discussion in Spinoza um, for a bit. There's also, secondly, a fairly technical discussion of the way in which we could develop a linguistics capable of expressing the characteristics of the hexiety. This takes place over pages 290 to 292 in my edition of A Thousand Plateaus. A suitable approach associated with the Danish linguist Jelmslu, any Danish speakers will have to forgive my pronunciation, Jelmslu is discussed at some length in whole plateaus, like plateaus 4 and 5 on linguistics and signs. Again, we can largely skip that bit and leave it for later, I suggest. It was important for Deleuze and Guattari to challenge and reject the dominant model of linguistics at the time, structural linguistics. The linguistics that claimed to explain everything in terms of abstract and universal combinations of signs and signifiers. I've briefly mentioned some criticism of, the, of this rather static conception in the stuff on the rhizome. A particular reason for criticising it was that this type of linguistics had been used by a major rival in psychoanalysis, a certain Jacques Lacan. Deleuze and Guattari turned to Yelmslu for a more congenial alternative. If you want to press on a bit further, 
I've added a link to a very good article on Yelmslu and A Thousand Plateaus in the list at the end. It's quite short as well. Finally, in this context setting bit, the term hexiety is clearly located in A Plateau on Becoming and it leads to a discussion of the plane of consistency in the section from page 292 onward. And we're also recommended to read that in the index. We'll discuss these important terms, becoming and plane of consistency, a little bit here, but we're going to largely postpone them for another day. One thing that is worth discussing here is the reference to the hexiety in the conclusion of A Thousand Plateaus, where it is mentioned in the context of a discussion of science, page 408 in my edition. However, by the time we get to read the relevant bits in A Thousand Plateaus and dialogues, we're going to do that first, we have already postponed or excused ourselves altogether from reading these difficult technical asides. We're left with a nice limited set of examples and I hope that's encouraging. Let's discuss a few examples from dialogues first. We actually have a definition of a hexiety here from Deleuze, referring to himself in the third person. Hexiotas is a term frequently used in the school of Duns Scotus in order to designate the individuation of beings. Deleuze uses it in a more special sense, in the sense of an individuation which is not that of an object nor of a person, but rather of an event, wind, river, day, or even hour of the day. Deleuze's thesis is that all individuation is in fact of this type. This is the thesis developed in Me Plateau with Felix Guattari. This is found in a note on page 151. So some specific events or objects seem to arise from human action, a painting or a sentence in a novel, and others form objects in nature, water and weather producing the Grand Canyon, say. But the underlying process is actually something else. Something else is producing these individuations, or at least the potential for them. The discussion in dialogues goes on to criticise the simplification of objects and events in Freudian accounts. For example, we can see sexuality and sexual desire as forming flexible assemblages of a range of specific activities directed at our own bodies, at other people and at various objects. Freud was wrong to try to simplify and solidify this flexibility and classify it into various forms like fetishism or perversions. These terms also imply value judgments, of course, because they are contrasted with normal sexuality. Structural linguistics is criticised on similar grounds, seeing underlying structures of language producing speech reduces the options for analysis and emphasises the categories. Instead, we should start with the pragmatics of enunciation. These involve examining the way people actually use language and the assemblages of enunciation they draw upon which will include bits of other people's thoughts and various linguistic items. While we're here, there is also an anti-humanist bit. So Charlotte Bronte is not the name of a single self-contained, uniquely gifted individual, but of a hexiety. All human individuals should be understood as a collection of hexieties. Not a single person, but more a collection of all the accidental things that have happened to them during their lives. Concepts are hexieties as well, and they don't refer to single and simple things either. We will discuss this later, but you might have already noticed this tendency in Deleuze and Guattari to use the same name both for specific things, specific rhizomes like couch grass roots and general mechanisms at a different level of reality. 
This can be baffling, but it is deliberate. Let's look at the discussion in A Thousand Plateaus. It's clear that the point of the hexiety, the whole concept, arises from the need to account for the sum of elements and forces involved in any object or event. We should not be reducing these down to a few supposedly major ones in the name of science. Hexiates form up first at the virtual level, from a combination of all sorts of factors and forces, and then they are realised or actualised to produce specific forms. At the virtual level, forces operate in a special intensive way, which is why we need these terms like longitude and latitude to chart them, as I was trying to argue above. Finally then, let's get to tangle with the actual examples. The first one is a bit bizarre, or playful, if you're a fan. We're told that those practicing demonology knew it wasn't enough just to cast the spells correctly or to know the victim. Other factors were involved in the success of the spell, like weather conditions, rain, hail, wind or polluted air, were required to transport the affects. The second example is the haiku, where a number of different qualities are brought together to make a surprising or insightful thought or observation. I found some nice examples online from haikupoetry.org. I think we've got time to read one. I'm not very good at reading haiku. This is one by Matsuo Basho. An old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Splash. Silence again. OK, well, the third example concerns Charlotte Bronte again and her recognition of the impact of weather events on human relationships. She talks a lot about the uh, background effects of the wind. And that's supported by a couple of quotes from Jane Eyre, I think. The fourth example is Lorca's poem referring to events at five o'clock. This is now available on the web with other work. You can find it at poethunter.com. He's burying his friend at five o'clock, but all sorts of other seemingly unconnected things are happening at the same time including pageants of life and death in the bullring. I'll let you read for yourselves the relevant poem. Again, uh, apologies to Spanish speakers. It's called Lament for Ignacio Sanchez Magius. The fifth example is a specific combination of white light and heat cited in Lawrence. No references, but I think this must be T.E. Lawrence. I vaguely remember him describing the impact of a memorable day in the Arabian desert like this. Intense white light and crushing heat. The sixth example is a nice homely one, a Norwegian omelette. Now I think this is what is known in the UK as a baked Alaska, where frozen ice cream or frozen yogurt, if you prefer, is contained in a conventionally baked sponge cake. So when you slice into it, it's both hot and cold at the same time. If you read on to the next section, you'll find more examples. Proust's novel, which describes a group of girls combining and losing their individual characteristics in a kind of group femaleness. This is discussed as a hexiety in Deleuze's book on Proust, Deleuze 2008. We're also told that Boulez's music, experimenting with different rhythms and time signatures, shows the characteristics of the hexiety. Unfortunately, I know nothing about Boulez's music. We're also told that humans are only a collection of hexiates, and they are more affected by circumstances than they sometimes realise. I tried to argue this a bit in the session on the rhizome. Deleuze and Guattari tell us that human beings are deeply affected often by a particular day, a season, a life, 
the climate, wind and fog, or their relationships to swarms and packs, which is the nearest Deleuze and Guattari get to talking about social groups. More exotic examples follow. There are vampires, which emerge only in the moonlight, or werewolves at full moon. The argument is, in other words, that both require atmospheric and lunar conditions in order to complete their transformation. OK, well that's a list of examples. There might be one or two more. Let's try and use ordinary reasoning again to see what on earth they might have in common. There seem to be two issues which Deleuze and Guattari want us to think about. First, they insist throughout that none of these hexieties operate in normal clock time. The actual events can be short-lived or last for years. Time is important, but it's not clock time. It's more the effects of different speeds and slownesses. Things developing at different rates are being brought together. We might think of werewolves. They certainly seem to transform themselves in a few minutes on particular dates. But there's a much longer evolution of the species to consider, and for that matter a long history of the moon supposedly affecting human behaviour as well. The implications are particularly relevant for human thinking about objects and forces. We tend to stick our own human time frame around things and forget all the other processes that have been slowly maturing in the background. This is anthropomorphism again. However, human time is not the only kind of time, and when we consider things like geological processes, for example, it's inadequate. Deleuze and Guattari want to refer to a classical Greek notion of time outside of human affairs altogether. Not chronos, but ion is the way they refer to it. Ion is an intensive time with its own rhythms. Unexpected combinations of things arriving at different speeds can have great personal and political significance producing what sociologists would call unintended consequences. Secondly, we're urged to consider the entire assemblage at work and its composition. The examples here are a bit unreferenced, alluding to other arguments in A Thousand Plateaus and Elsewhere. We're told, for example, that streets as well as horses are involved. This is a reference to a much-discussed case study in Freud concerning the legendary Little Hans. Poor old Little Hans developed an aversion to going outside and this focused especially on a fear of horses. His father discussed the case with Freud. Professor Freud eventually decided inevitably on the sexual connotations, especially that Horses often pulled box-like carriages, and this was a symbolic way of Hans expressing anxiety that his mother would have another child. Boxes stood for wombs. Deleuze and Qatari continually argue here, and in Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Qatari 1984, that this is far too reductive and that other elements were involved as well in a whole assemblage that the poor lad was trying to form up and express, including in this case Hans's desire to play in the streets with the poor kids, which his parents forbade. The example of dying rats sniffing the fresh air and reviving a bit refers to a story about a rat colony by a certain Hoffmannstahl which is discussed elsewhere in A Thousand Plateaus. I haven't read it yet, I'm afraid. There is another example involving animals, a dog walking on the road. This is cited in a novel by Virginia Woolf. I'm afraid I'm not sure which one, and of course it isn't referenced. However, this has become a famous example. A particular dog walks on a particular road and together the combination produces some affect. 
It's significant and insightful for Wolf and her readers. Deleuze and Guattari take this as a prime example and say that in order to get all the factors in and give them equal weight, we should use phrases such as the animal stalks at five o'clock with dashes in between the words. So, overall, the examples seem to feature a coming together of elements of different types, an animal and a human construction, or humans and weather conditions. This is the longitudinal dimension we mentioned earlier. We might think of them first as accidental collisions of factors that have some emerging importance. Sometimes it's lifelong importance. One example is when Proust's hero meets Albertine, a young French lady who finally joins the group of girls that he's been observing and who will be his lover and have quite a significant effect on him. Or, as we saw, when a particular dog on a particular road sparks off some insight for Virginia Woolf. The collisions have lots of affects. They stretch across a lot of latitude. In case you haven't had enough, there's another often repeated example discussed in other sections of A Thousand Plateaus and also discussed in dialogues. This concerns horses, which have evolved over millennia and happen to end up in the human era with physical and temperamental qualities that are very useful for we human beings. We could domesticate them and use them. Human technology was also developing comparatively rapidly until a real breakthrough emerged when it came together with the modern horse. And in this case, it took the form of the metal stirrup. Deleuze and Guattari described this as the man-horse-stirrup assemblage. Putting metal stirrups on powerful horses led to much more effective military uses for horses. And the whole process led to the emergence of the mounted warrior, playing an important part in human history or, in Europe, the chivalric knights. There's one last point to make about these examples. We described them just now as accidents, but Deleuze sees them quite differently as always produced by combinations of forces or assemblages. Dun Scotus, mentioned in the definition we started with, saw everything as necessarily caused by God with no room at all for accidents. If you've got an all-powerful intervening god, you can't have accidents. Well, roughly, for Deleuze, the same might be said of being, with a capital B. The forces operating at the virtual level cause everything. Being speaks with one voice, as he puts it, the univocity of being. We can't write off these important collisions of events as mere accidents, something inexplicable. Well, even the UK police force know that, because they no longer refer to collisions of motor vehicles as accidents. They used to be RTA, road traffic accidents. Now they are RTC, road traffic collisions. And this implies that they need to be investigated. They can't just be dismissed as accidents. The last appearance of the term in the index refers to the conclusion of A Thousand Plateaus, page 408 in my edition. And this reminds us of some implications of the hexiety in the middle of a discussion about two models of science. One model, the familiar one if you like, looks for laws and assumes constants or invariants. The other version does not make these assumptions and argues instead that there are no constants, that everything is in variation. Objects and events never stay still, but are always changing or becoming. As a result, equations and laws can only ever be approximate. There are singular objects, distinctive individuations or hexieties. Terms like object or essence are used to describe them, 
but they really only offer a vague working definition. As always, it's the underlying forces that we need to study. Insisting on fixed definitions, laws and essences only stratifies reality. There are clear political implications to that term, and we have to oppose with that notion terms that imply specificity and flow. So hexiotes are therefore real, but they can't be pinned down too easily, or not by positivist science. They can be understood instead as wandering or nomadic essences. They are continuums of intensities, intensive forces. They're not just fixed locations on continuums. They are matters that involve individual variation and becoming. We get a hint of Deleuzean ethics here too, perhaps, when we're told that in general, the ones with the most connections are the most valuable ones. However, not all hexiotes are good, as you might expect from this general indifference to humans. Some can be harmful, like cancers. So we've used the term hexiety to begin to get to grips with some important general arguments in Deleuzean philosophy. Whether these terms are fully interchangeable is debatable. For my money, a hexiety, if it means anything distinctive, is one type of assemblage or event, one that produces a particularly well-individuated distinctive outcome, something that seems to be distinctive or unique. Now, the precise links with the event and the singularity are still unclear to me, and I need to work on that a bit more. Returning briefly to the bit right at the beginning, where Deleuze describes his writing collaborations with Guattari as like a hexiety, perhaps what he means is that although these distinctive books that have been produced look as if they are written by a single person, two rather different individuals came together, no doubt with a lot of other factors as well, to produce them. It was not just him. If that is so, I think this is a useful way to remind us that Guattari played a major part in the writing as well as Deleuze, although quite often that's forgotten. Many other questions still remain. Hexiates form up at the virtual level before being operationalised and actualised, in some cases long before humans were even around. However, all the examples seem to require some human intervention to unite the elements or to register their effects. Deleuze reminds us that there is nothing in the notion of a uniquely gifted individual, though. They are all collections of hexiates, so the hexiety is the prior term. As before, we might be arguing that humans are really no more than conduits for forces of the universe, or perhaps that the elements that enable human activities, like fighting on horseback, were in existence long before and were just coordinated by humans. Human interests are possibly smuggled in somewhere else, though. We are told to say the whole phrase, the animal stalks at five o'clock. But why stop there? Why not bring in everything else that is connectable? the geological formation of the landscape it stalks in, the other animals in the vicinity. We could have an endless sentence with dashes between the terms. An animal stalks at five o'clock past trees with roosting bats living in caves in cliffs of sandstone laid down in the Cretaceous era, which, etc. We don't extend things like this because we decide to limit it in our own interests. This is surely what orthodox science is doing too, discounting variation and the rest for all practical purposes. Perhaps it is not a denial of complexity so much as a pragmatic approach to it.